Praise the Lord, all you nations. Lift him up, all you peoples. For the Lord is great and mighty. All right, let's open our Bibles. We'll start again from the ones we have been reading again and again. And then we'll add some more to it. Once again, let's go to the book of Revelations. Revelation. The revelation that God gave give to John. Chapter 17. Let's just start again from um, verse 12. It's just verse 14 we want, but 12 gives us some context. He said, these have one purpose. It was referring to the ten horns, which are ten kings. And who give, you know, and he said, they, they receive authority of, as kings with the beast for one hour. He said, these have one purpose. And what is that purpose? What's that purpose? They give their power and authority to the beast. Now, in seven, the purpose of the beast, that's how you give your power and authority to him. These will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them because he is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And those who are with him are the called and chosen and faithful. Please notice that again. They are the called and chosen and faithful. Those are the ones that are with him. Again, what that means in this context, these are not the ones who are, who are claiming to be Christians alone. These are not the ones that have come to the Lamb for the redemption of their sins alone. These are not the ones that have come for healing and for program, for breakthrough and for various kinds of answers. These are the ones that have enlisted themselves, all right? They have enlisted themselves as warriors of the Lord. These are people who have seen their lives as, you know, as being warriors, instruments of war, soldiers of Christ. They see that when they were giving life to, it was so that they could go into battle. These are people who have considered that they are living not for themselves, but for the pleasure of the Lamb. These are people who are not following the Lamb for what they are going to get out of Him, but for what service they can be to Him. These are not people who come to church looking for miracles. These are people who come to church looking for service. These are people who see that except the pleasure of God prospers by their hands, those things will never be done. Those are the people we are talking about here. And like I said last time, I've said many times before, that these are very scarce people. These are not people that are easy to find. These are uncommon Christians. Now, notice that. They are uncommon Christians. Please bear this in mind. Now let's read again from the book of Job. I'm just talking about faithfulness again, which was what we discussed last time. Last time we talked about the key to faithfulness. How John the Baptist was baptizing without promising healing. John the Baptist was baptizing without promising you know, prosperity. John the Baptist came with one baptism for the remission of sins. That is, he came for baptizing a baptism of repentance for the uh, for the forgiveness of sins. He was warning people to flee from the judgment about, the come, about to come. That was the only thing he seemed to have promised, deliverance from judgment to come. John the Baptist was not promising healing. I'm not aware that the man was even conscious of, of healing because when Jesus was healing and they went to him, they, he sent a message and said, are you the one to come or we are to expect another? Because the only thing that John the Baptist preached was that there would be deliverance. You understand? And the way he understood, the limit of his understanding about deliverance was deliverance from oppression. Okay? So when Jesus came, and so when he saw Jesus, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the whole world, he was excited that deliverance has, has finally come. He was excited that God would not liberate his people. Don't forget, his former disciples became the disciples of Jesus. People like... Um, uh, Peter and John and co. They were disciples of um, John. And you remember that Peter was the one that, you know, he showed to Peter and co. This is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the whole world. And they left following him 
and they began to follow Jesus. And these are the same people who said at the end, will you at this time restore the kingdom back to Israel? And now when they said that, you see, they were being trained, and part of their training was from John the Baptist. So they were expecting deliverance of the nation of Israel. They were expecting deliverance. That's what they were expecting from oppression. Yet when Jesus came, what was he doing? Healing the sick, raising the dead. Ah, and he was preaching and preaching and preaching. So John said to him, are you the one to come or we should expect another one? Because this, what you are doing is not what I expected. Please bear that in mind. So John the Baptist, therefore, did not preach that healing will come. John the Baptist, therefore, did not preach that prosperity will come. He did not preach that there will be reason of the dead. Yet people followed him. Why? He was baptizing for the remission of their sins, for the forgiveness of their sins. He was baptizing and energizing people for repentance. That was what John the Baptist was doing. Don't ever forget that. Yet, this is a principle. The Bible says that the Pharisees and the scribes, they frustrated the counsel of God for their lives, not having been baptized by John. But the scribes and, co I'm sorry, the commoners, the publicans, and the common people, they rejoiced. Why? Because they had been baptized by John. Now, I'm not going to bring out something here. The baptism of John, okay? That's what I'm going to bring out here. The baptism of John was what prepared the people for the miracles that Jesus did, even though they did not know those miracles were going to happen. That was why Jesus said to us, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and every other thing will be added to you. Don't forget it. Seek first the kingdom of God. Now, this is the problem of this age, the, in Christianity I'm talking about now. The problem is this. We say, seek, seek the blessing, and the righteousness will be added to you. So people come to church and they are doing righteousness for the sake of the blessing. And that, I say to you again, is a major problem. That, I say to you again, is a major problem. Job, I want us to understand something. Except we get this right, what Jesus paid for will not be manifested. For a long time, many of us may not, have, may not have understood why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, or what that thing means. I will tell you, what it means is that it is not those who are looking for prosperity that will find it. No, it's those who are looking for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And if you, look for, if you don't look for the right thing, that is the kingdom of God, and you find that prosperity, as a Christian, you will not be blessed by it. You will not be blessed by it. If you struggle with your own strength and your energy, okay, to enter into something that God did not by himself give to you, eventually you lose out entirely. The book of Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 5,000 female donkeys, and very many servants. And, this, and that man was the greatest of all the men of the East. He was a businessman. You don't have 500 yoke of oxen to be admiring them. Yoke, uh, oxen were for plowing. They were not for sale. Do you follow my point? So when the man has 500 yoke of oxen, they are telling you the extent of land he had to cultivate. So this man was a businessman. 500 female donkeys was for transportation. Dangote cement. Are you getting my point? <laughs> he was carrying things up and down. So I'm going to explain this man was a rich man. You know, before we want to calculate his wealth, we used to think, how much do you sell 500 yoke of oxen? We forgot that these things were serving purposes. They did not tell us here how much land he had. That's why you have 500 yoke of oxen. That's the amount of land the man had to plow. The amount of land he had to put wheat on. Now, please, I'm trying to bring out something. He was a very wealthy man. So that's the issue. Very, very wealthy. Successful materially. Now, the matter now came up. And there was a day when the sons of God, I'm in verse 6, came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? 
And he answered the Lord from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Please notice that. Fearing God and turning away from evil. This man was not sowing seeds for prosperity. He was just turning away from evil. Be it in mind. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. I'm going to stop reading here. Mainly because this is a story we all know, nothing new. I just felt like reading it for us to know about Job again. Nothing new. I will just refer to us the rest of the story. Now, a few days ago here, I taught briefly, as it were, about this book of Job, what Job was about. I referred to it the first time it was broken for me. And since then, I've had insight into the things that happened with Job. And we explained that Job... The, that pastor preached to me that day was placed in the Bible to cure the backsliding of the saints forever. I explained it that day. I also explained that each person was, I was created to make a statement about God. Here, Job, his assignment was to make a statement that people could love God or people can love God for who he is. Now, what am I talking about today? I want to emphasize to us again that issue about Job, that Job was placed there as something for us to all look up to. It's crucial we get this point. Because in today's Christianity, faithfulness is uncommon. I said it last time. God cannot use unfaithful people. You know, there are people that God really uses. Let me just sidetrack, you know, go to, on the side a bit. Let me just go on the side for a bit, and then I'll go back to my main message. Everybody serves God's purpose. Did I hear an amen? amen? Even the thief is serving the purpose of God. Do you know that? Are you aware of that? Let's read it now. Sometimes when you quote these things, people don't believe what you are saying. Let's see what Solomon said to us about that. Okay, Proverbs chapter 16. He said, The Lord has made everything for his own purpose, for his own purposes. I'm reading the New Living Translation. Even the wicked for a day of disaster. If you read that without looking at it closely, you think God prepared the wicked so he can bring them to disaster. No, that's not what he means. He said, the Lord has made everything to accommodate itself and contribute to its own end and his own purpose. Even the wicked are fitted for their role for the day of calamity and the day of evil. That's the Amplified Bible. That is, everybody has a role he plays in this life. Do you get my point here? These people, if they are wicked, God has left them for the day of destruction. So if God wants to take away somebody's property... He sends a thief, does not send a righteous man. Are you getting my point? So that's what it means. The day of judgment is a thief that God will send. He will not send a righteous man. Jesus will be betrayed. Will be betrayed. Amen? Amen? That's the truth. So who will he send? He wouldn't send John. He wouldn't send um, Peter. He wouldn't send Thomas. Thomas was one of the most faithful of the disciples. You know that. Thomas was the one that said he wants to die. Let's go and die with him. He said, let's go and raise Lazarus. The other one said, ah, are you not aware that they want to kill you? So Thomas said, let's go. Say he wants to die. Let's follow him so that they can kill all of us together. He was a very faithful disciple. So God couldn't send him. He couldn't send Nathaniel. Behold, an Israelite, in, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deception, no guile, no shadiness, nothing. He couldn't send him. Say, so what do we do? The Lord has made everything for a purpose, even the evil man, the wicked man for the day of evil, all right? So he sent Judas. How do you know the man was evil? From day one, he was stealing. As soon as he entered the ministry, he, be, he began to steal money. Everybody was going around preaching. He was completing his house in the village. And Jesus knew. The day the biggest offering came, the lady who brought a massive offering one time, what did she do? She broke the offering and poured it on Jesus. Jesus said, Ye, eh, sorry, Judas said, Ye believe. Why didn't you just bring this thing? You sell it, you bring the money. 
That's why Jesus called Peter, John, come, John, come. Do you know why he said that? John said, no, Lord. He's a thief. <laughs> no, the truth. Many people were shout. No, I, I know I'm always digressing. Hmm? Don't follow people. I'll tell you why. In a moment. Many people are shouting, the poor, the poor, the poor. They are lying. What did Judas say? You could have given this money to the poor. Jesus said, don't worry. He was, he was not concerned about the poor. He was concerned about what he would steal. Don't follow human beings when they are making noise. Some of these freedom fighters or these uh, civil rights activists are falling in society. You don't know what they are fighting for. Don't follow them at all. Just do, do what is right. So Jesus, to be betrayed, God had to send Judas. That was the meaning of God made everyone, everything to fit a purpose. Even if you are wicked, God will use you. I hope you're getting my point. So that you are being used by God is not a big deal. Anything will be used by God and everybody will be used by him. What he will use you for is now the story. Whether you'll be rewarded. Jesus was betrayed by Judas, right? Was that a good thing or a bad thing for us? For us, was it good or bad? For the purpose of God, was it good or bad? But then why did they now say that it would have been better if he was not born? It was the purpose of God that he would be betrayed. He said it himself. He said, but, ah, cursed is that man by whose hands he will be betrayed. He said, it would have been better that he was not born. So for Judas, it was a terrible experience. For many people used by God also, that's how it is. So whether you'll be used by God is not the issue. Everybody will be used. But whether that use will be according to his purpose for your life and whether you will get a reward for it is not determined by how you personally behave. But what I'm saying is very, very important. Let's get that point very clear. I just wanted to drop that, by the way, because we see it all the time. People often don't get it. But what does God want from us? For us to be used for a good purpose. In every household, Paul taught us, there are vessels for honor, honorable use, and there are vessels for dishonorable use. If you want to be a vessel for honorable use, what do you do? You cleanse yourself of all defilement. That's it. Then you become one prepared for the master's, pardon me to add a word to it, for the master's good use. Because everybody will be used one way or the other. Let's go back to the matter of Job. In Job's case, God said, I have sent Job to describe a part of me. I want people who will describe a part of me. I want people who will be used to explain what God is really like. I want people that will fulfill the purpose for which I created them, not the ones I'm now using them for. I can assure you of something. God, if Judas had cleansed himself of all defilement, God would have used him for the real purpose that the Judas was created for, not that one. He made himself available for what was evil. That was why God used him for that. But what we are preaching is that we believers must make sure that we are used for what God created us for. Like he said to Isaiah, who sh in his hearing, who shall I send? Who will go for us? Isaiah said, here I am, send me. He said to Jeremiah, this was the reason why I gave you life. Before you were born, I knew you. While you were yet in your mother's womb, I consecrated you to be a prophet. Let me say to you again. It does not mean Jeremiah must do it by force. Jeremiah could still have said no. And God will have found another ignoble use for him. I hope you're getting that point. Jeremiah had to consciously yield. If it will have happened automatically, the Lord would not have had a discussion with him. For God to discuss with Mary is because Mary could have said no. I don't know what I get my point. Mary could have said no. That's why the angel came. And each person one of us in our lives must say yes deliberately. I'm going somewhere with all of this talk. Everybody must deliberately say yes. I said the last time I've said it again, God is lacking in people. He has a problem finding enough people. 
who will say yes deliberately. Secondly, who will say that yes and be persistent in yes. And third, who will increase the intensity of the yes. Three things I say. One, those who will say, those who will say yes. Two, those who will continually say yes. And three, those who will increase the intensity of the yes. These last two describe faithful people. Back to Job. So in Job's case, we know the story. It was important to Job, to God, that's why I'm bringing up the matter of Job, that Job be shown to be a man who is not serving God for what he's going to get. Job was tremendously blessed. God let that happen to lead him to this particular point. Job was blessed. Listen, no matter how well Job was blessed, except God demonstrates that Job is not serving me for the blessing I gave to him, Job is useless to him. I hope you're getting my point. To God, Job had to show, or it had to be demonstrated in the life of Job, that Job is not serving God for what he's getting. Please, I, you know, today I was thinking, what do I preach? And I said, I'm going to preach what I've preached before. I will repeat it almost verbatim if I have to. Because it's so crucial. You see what I'm talking about in a moment. Now, let me just continue what I'm saying. It was, it's so important to God. I said there's a problem to this Christian. You know, I said it before. And what is that problem? We have preached and modified our doctrines to the extent that it's as if God is a good church is a place we go to go and collect. The best example of our erroneous doctrine is in the area of giving. Christians are taught to give so that they can receive. The unfortunate side is this. Many times you even challenge people and say this is not so. They will twist scriptures to show you that it is so. And they start reading the scriptures wrongly. That when God gave his son, he did not get many sons back. And it will appear true if you are not of the discerning spirit. I say, wait. Forget what he got back. Why is the question? I, the Lord, I search the reason why you are doing what you are doing. Why is the question? Did he do that so that he can get many sons back? The answer is no. The Bible tells us why he did it. He says so that they will not perish but have eternal life. That was why he did it. If he got many sons back, it is because there is a law in the spirit. Whatsoever he got souls. That shall be also reaper. He's a man. I'm just trying to adapt it here. So it's played in his favor. But why is important? We twist the scriptures. At the end of the day, we breed. This is why I'm talking. Why I'm talking about it. At the end of the day, we breed Christians. Listen to this: who are useless to God. In the true use, now you no, know, everybody will be used. In the true usefulness of people, we end up breeding Christians who are useless to Him. Anytime they are going to church, it is expect a miracle. You know, we had a program in Port Harcourt some time ago. One pastor came. No, of course, you know, we go to Port Harcourt regularly. One of our programs. One pastor came. He looked and said, hmm. Now, the number of people there was not so, it wasn't head shaking, you know, like, uh, I can't remember that day, maybe it would be something between 150 in attendance. Not up to 200. I don't think we're up to 200. So he said, but I thought, this is a crusade. Remember? He said, this is a crusade. Ah, this number of people gathered, and you are not, you are not promising anything. He said, you came to teach the word, and this number of people gathered. He said, this is, this is landslide. He said, nobody gathers here except you are killing witches. <laughs> you often won't break through the other. That you just, I've forgotten the topic for our program that particular. Of course, we just have teaching programs. Like the one we're doing in Okada next month is titled Preserving Your Life Through the Fear of God. That's the title. I'm not here to, you know, I told you I'm not a massage my back pastor. I said, what I'm saying is that if you don't fear God, you will die. That's what, that's what I've just come to preach. No, if, if, I mean, if you have seen the poster, if you have not shared it yet, it's called Preserving Your Life through the fear of God. We didn't want your daddy in Oka. Lord, what do you think of my righteousness? We wanted to explain the righteousness of God. 
the one of the ones we did portal at that time was called faithful stewards how are christians faithful that's our topics real faith last one we did in makode was true faith what is true faith so the brother said ah hey you come you come to portal with this kind of topic and you have this number of people this is a big ministry that is normally nobody gathers around things like this when christians want to gather it is emergency breakthrough. By the end of this night, poverty will be over. Now, this one I'm making. So we bred Christians who reason like that. And this is my prophetic message. The Lord is sad and is tired. He is sad and he's tired. He hates it. Notice what I said. He hates it when we gather to pray. And the prayer points are what we shall eat, what we shall drink, and with what shall we clothe ourselves. He hates it when Christians make decisions. And where I will be safe to prosper materially is what is in front of them. The Lord is saddened by it. Listen to me. He was excited when Solomon did not ask for anything apart from wisdom to do the will of God. That lets you know he would have been sad even though he would have answered and given if Solomon had asked for material things. Please, this point is important. He took Job and blessed him materially and said, I want to make Job an example that people can serve God and not be concerned about the material blessing. Go and read the book of Job again. The temptation of Job was never Satan's idea. We look at this as if, as if the devil is our problem. No. The devil was not the problem of Job. It was God that called Satan's attention and said, Have you considered my servant Job? He knew how he would respond. He's called an accuser of the brethren. So he began to accuse Job. Please, my emphasis is not on, it's not on Job right now. It's if we had to change positions to this Christian. Uh, have you considered my servant Job? Many people give these days. You know the doctrine of tithing we carry on our heads. Hmm? I'm not here to talk about whether it is right or wrong. Many of us like it because we are idolaters and we love our material possession. So we are afraid of Satan. So it is easy for me to get you to tithe. All I need to do is remind you of how you may lose your business or your children every day. You will tithe regularly. I don't know whether you're getting my point. That's all I need to do. I just say, listen, the devourer is coming. If you don't pay your protection money, you're you are dead. So when we are giving it, you know, I told you when adults are arguing, what they're arguing about is not what you're thinking of. Look, look, let's get this point clear. When adults are arguing, what you are arguing about, what they're arguing about is not what looks obvious. If they are saying, did the Bible say this or didn't say this, that's what you are hearing. What they are really arguing about is, how much will you remove from my pocket or add to it? You know, the, one of the scriptures I like from the book of <laughs> Acts, I'm saying many things. Uh, yes, I'm liking it. Let's go there. This one is very important, you know. In Acts chapter 19, Now, because it's not our main message, I just want to quickly refer to it. In Ephesus, Paul has been doing miracles, preaching the word of God. The ministry has been moving seriously under Paul. As a result of that, look at verse 38. Acts chapter 19, verse 18, sorry, that's it, 38. Verse 18. He said, many also of those who had believed kept coming, confessing and disclosing their practices. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. They counted up the price of them, found it to be about 50,000 pieces of silver. That's millions of dollars in today's money. Now, verse 20 says, so the word of God was growing mightily and prevailing. Now, I want you to understand something here. 
Now, verse 21. And after these things, Paul proposed in the spirit to go to Jerusalem. After ha- and after he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, saying, after, I've be- after I have been there, I also must see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of those who, were minister- uh, who ministered to him, T- uh, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. He stayed in Asia for a while. About that time, there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way, that is the, the, the way of the Lord. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing, was bringing no little business to the people who made the, you know, the, 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 the craftsmen, that is the people who worked for him, to the craftsmen. This he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades and said, men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. I hope, I hope you're following that. Why were they gathering together to check, look out for their prosperity? You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but also in all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people, saying that the gods made with the hands are no gods at all. Now, you think he's fighting for God, for the gods. Not only is there danger that this trade of ours fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be disregarded as worthless, and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship with even be dethroned from her magnificence. For time's sake, we'll stop reading. So a riot broke out to defend who? Artemis. But let me ask you, was the problem Artemis? What was the problem? Okay, very, verse 32. So before that riot began, People began to make noise. Verse 29, the city was filled with confusion. And they rushed with one according to the theater, dragging Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions. Now, where I want you to understand is that verse 20. Where did I quote just now? 32. So then some were shouting one thing and some another. For the assembly was in confusion, and the majority did not know for what reason they had come together. That's what I wanted to note. Majority did not know what was going on. I said to you earlier, be careful when you are following people. Again, I'm, I'm taking a lot of side trips. I just feel like giving words of wisdom as I'm going on. Be careful when you are following people. When people argue over doctrine, that's why I went to all of this. Many times it's not the accuracy. I have talked to pastors. It shocks me why they can't see what is clear in scriptures. Until like God is understanding, so I don't argue anymore. When you argue in doctrine, should we tie, should we not tie it? The issue is never, no, okay, I withdraw that. The issue is rarely the accuracy of the doctrine. The issue always is, how does it affect us? People have said to me before, if, if what you are saying is true, how will the church get money? And I always, I've always answered them, is that the discussion? We are saying, did God commanded this? Did God command this? Or he did not command it? That's what we are saying. Is this a commandment of God? Or it is not? You have made it a commandment. Is it? So this is how to do this. Uh, no, these are arguments I've heard with people. I've had with people. At the end of the day, that's okay. All right. This is church position. This is the position of this church. I said, look at these people. And you call yourself a pastor. Is the position of the church you are discussing rather than the truth of the gospel of God? I'm going somewhere. Many of the Christians also who follow some doctrines. They are not following it because they've seen it from scriptures. They are not following for it because they've seen it from scriptures. They are following these doctrines because it fits their idolatrous mentality and it fits their desire for self-preservation. So when you say to them, these are people who are not faithful in anything, but they say, how do I bless the whole of the year? They say, give the first salary. They don't love God. They don't care about anything. They want to protect 11 months salary. I used to wonder, why does God tolerate all these false doctrines? I said, I've now understood why. He said, the people that it's working on like it like that. They are afraid of freedom. They are afraid of freedom. Because freedom puts a lot of responsibility upon you. Freedom. Freedom puts a lot of responsibility on people. When we are not serving like Job, you know, it's Job that we're talking about. Many people, what they are looking for, which is, I, I'm, I'm talking about, we switching positions with Job. Many people, that's the issue. 
God has had blessed Job. Look at the amount of money and businesses Job had. I told you before, don't look at the yoke of um, the, the number of donkeys as animals, counting one by one. If you're talking about peace mass transit. I don't know whether you're getting my point here. It's not the buses. It's the number of people. It's a transportation business they're describing for you that Job had. When you had 500 uh, yoke of oxen, it's not the oxen. It's the land, the farm that that is describing. If Job had only one hectare, one yoke of oxen could do the job. Why did he need 500? I hope you're getting my point here. So God had blessed people. God had blessed Job. What many Christians do, that's why I went to all of that, is how do I protect that which God has given me? So somebody will come and say, raise an altar in the corner of your house. They will raise the altar. Somebody will come and say to them, pay a tithe, they will pay a tithe. Every time you will bring new formulae for self-preservation. And those things prosper amongst believers because they are not faithful Christians. They are self-preserving Christians. Judging Christianity is very difficult. That's individuals. You don't know why people are doing what they are doing. There are those who are spending money building churches all the time. And pastors say, this guy is faithful. <laughs> Some are doing it for a breakthrough they are expecting. Some are doing it to cleanse their sins. Two of them, evil reasons. So this, this man loves the Lord. He has built three churches by himself. You think you are going to the same heaven? I've heard pastors say it. You know when I hear it, eh? I feel like packing my bag and walking out. How can you be a preacher and some things come out from your mouth? So he builds houses. So for that reason, we are not going to the same heaven again. His heaven is not superior to my own. When you don't know the reason why he's doing what he's doing. Two reasons. Evil reasons people do such things. There's a good reason, all right? We're not discussing that. I just want to bring out the evil ones. One, many are looking for preservation. Look at the extent of business. How do we ensure? And of course, it's easy to scare them. Just tell, warn them about the devourer. So you make a demand on their income all the time. They are not giving to you. They don't care about you. They don't care about God. All they care about is Preserve for me that which you have given me already. What will it cost? You just want 10%? You're a good God. I want to say you're a good God. What they mean is that you're not expensive. It's a good deal. And you will bring more. Listen, if you are reasoning like this, that's my message for today. Part of it, okay? If you are reasoning like this, you are not yet serving God. You are serving yourself. You are serving mammon. Please get the point. You are serving yourself and you are serving mammon. Please, I will say it one more time. I don't care the number of churches you have built or the number of offerings you have given. If what will God give me back, how will I protect that which he has given me? Is the reason why you did it, you have not served God yet. You have not learned how to serve God. You've been serving yourself and serving mammon. Matter of fact. Some others... They do that for the simple reason of paying for their sins. You see a thief building churches. Anytime churches, and you know sometimes we churches are very interesting people. We know them. We know the rogues. So when we want to raise money, we call them. We know their conscience will not let them raise. They will give. I will not, that's another thing. You, you may be surprised, but this is a matter of fact. And we will not preach the truth. Because if we preach the truth, they will stop giving. Because if we preach the truth, they can't pay for their sins, they know. They can't pay to free their conscience. You will tell them that. And that one, it will hurt our bottom line, like we say. So we won't preach the truth. Listen to me. If you have given and working hard, wherever you are listening to this one from, to pay for your sins, you have not saved God yet. All your offerings don't count. Each time you give, God is angrier than before. Now, that's not a joke. Every new offering is an addition to your iniquity. 
That is, your sin was on a scale of 1 to 10 billion. If your sin was on level 5 billion before, each time you give an offering, you add 500,000 to it. Okay, that's difficult. Let's say on level 1 to 10. Before you on level 3, each time you add an offering, 0.5 is added. Very soon you are going to get to level 10, and then God will not punish you suddenly. How am I preaching this one today? It's good. People should carry it. I, I think it's not for just for here. I want it to be to be spread abroad. Each time a sinner gives, because of his sin, he is sinning some more. Each time he helps the poor, because of his sin, his sin is worse than before. His judgment has increased. I what I'm saying is making sense to all of us. What is he supposed to do? Confess your sins, repent. Then we take it from there. You can't pay. You can't pay. And if you have been forgiven and you have accepted forgiveness, there are some people like that. Just that Satan now wants to be deceiving them. That they have not totally been forgiven. You know, the first set I talked about are thieves that don't want to. The cost of repentance is high. You know what they call the cost of repentance? It's too high. So they are donating and donating and donating. That one's they are still in iniquity. But there are some that are no longer in iniquity. They have been freed. But Satan is still bugging them. Their conscience will rise once in a while to talk to them. So to kill the voice of the conscience, they start doing the opposite of what they did before. This is what I mean. A man said he used to be a pimp. You know what the pimp is? He used to do racketing, prostitution, and all of that. Guarding prostitutes and all of that. Now that he's born again, he's not trying to rescue girls from prostitution. Are you getting my point? Tell anybody you know like that that you are starting another set of iniquity. Yes. You see somebody who was into trafficking. Now that he's given his life to Christ, he's now on the Mediterranean trying to fish for those who fell into the water. Why? His conscience is not letting him rest. Now, take this news to such people. You have started another set of iniquity. Even though what you are doing appears right and otherwise would have been good, but because you are using it without realizing it to pay for your former sins, you are now insulting Jesus on a daily basis. Yes. Let's make it simple. Assuming you came to me and every day you are in one man's house, you are Clearing the no, or you are in the gate begging. Wait, please, oh, maybe the man arrested your wife and your children. No, you know, held them hostage. Why? Because you are owing ten million naira. Then one morning you are about to go to his house to go and beg again. I said, no, your wife and children are back home. I paid the man the ten million. In fact, I added another half a million because I added half a million because. I, in case he's saying there's some interest accruing things we don't know, let's just be sure. So I called him and I said, I have paid. And you're on the phone, you say to me, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Hmm? I hope you have learned my point. <clears throat> then next day I come to your house. I'm just passing by. I say, ah, where's Mr. Ajale Koko? The nurse say he's not at home, sir. Where did he go? He went to chief... Uh, Okori Koko's house, the man that imprisoned, that detained his wife and children for some months before you delivered him. Ah, what is he doing there? He's clearing the grass in front of his house. Why? He said he doesn't want to take chances, so that he loves his wife and children so much, he doesn't want them to be retaken captive because of any debt. So he's there sweeping and clearing grass and digging up the gutter and all of that. They are asked, did he borrow money again? He said, no, sir. He didn't borrow money. It's that same 10 million that I was owing. That's why he has still gone back there. Now, think about it. You and I were human beings. If you were the one that paid the 10 million, what would be the thought that would come through your mind? You ask yourself, is he stupid? That is one. Number two, he does not believe me. That's what's come through your mind. He doesn't believe me when I said I paid. 
So you're going to go back to him and like, what is wrong with you? And he looks at you and says, come on, let us go. He says, oh I can't go. You know, once a debtor, always a debtor. Can you see the way it is? That is how it is with Christians who are still doing the opposite of the iniquity they used to do as a way of paying off for those days. And listen, the worst thing you can say to the Lord, listen to this, the worst thing you can say to the Lord, or you can do, that's a better way, the worst thing you can do to the Lord is to tell him he does not know what he's saying. You can insult God different ways. The worst of insults is for you to call him a liar. I've told this testimony, well, this testimony Ken Hagen shared in one of his materials on some of his messages again and again. And it's beautiful. To let you know how God takes it. Listen to this. The Lord appeared to him sometime before that. And said, this is how you will use the anointing I have given you to minister to the sick. You, among the things you will do, you will place your hands on the two sides of the person's body. If a fire jumps from one hand to the other, you will feel it. Fire leap from one hand into your other hand. He said, that is a sign for you to know. An evil spirit is inside that man's body causing that sickness. So you will stop ministering directly to the sickness. You will cast out the evil spirit. Is there any time you tell the evil spirit to come out in my name, it will go. And that was guaranteed. It's fine. Then one day was ministering. One man had his he had tuberculosis of the spine and um, his back was stiff. And he placed a hand to minister to him. And then suddenly he felt fire jump. Ah, he said, this is a case of demonic oppression. So he turned to the demon and said, come out in the name of Jesus. I told the man, check whether you're okay now. The man checked, nothing. Ah, he put his hand, fire jumped again. He cast out the demon. I told the man, check. The man checked, nothing. Ah, he put his hand a third time. The same thing occurred. He prayed the same thing. He said he got confused and told the man, please go and sit down. So he went ahead playing for other people. Then suddenly the same vision of the Lord that I had years before or some time before appeared to him again. And this time the Lord said only one thing to him. Only him saw him. So the Lord said, I said it will go. Now, this is why I'm, I'm telling you the story. You don't tell God, he doesn't know what he's saying. He said, I said it will go. And you know what he said? But Lord, you see, it did not. He said, I've seen him many times. I've never seen him angry. His eyes turned to flames of fire. He said, people have told me before, what does the Lord look like? Say, I can't describe him. He said, but one thing you look into his eyes, they look like, you know, oceans of love, like depths of love without a boundary. He said, this time around, it turned to flames. And all he said is, I said it will go. And it said to the Lord, but you saw it now. It didn't go. And then the vision ended. The Lord didn't give him any explanation. Nothing. Then he got really confused. And the Holy Spirit so present. Must have nudged him. And said, oh boy, he said it will go. It went. So he called the man back. He went through the rounds again. This time when I told the demon, come out in the name of Jesus. He said, now you are healed. Touch your toes. He didn't argue with my check. He just said, now you are healed. Touch your toes. The man bent. His back was free entirely in an instant. Don't tell God he doesn't know what he's saying. So if he tells somebody, I have forgiven you, if you try and pay for that sin, he will punish you. That's not a joke. If he tells you, I have forgiven you, if he says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive. And you confessed. And the word said he forgave. And you tried to pay for the sins. You know, those days, you know, we used to sing in the world. We used to jump from one club to the other. Those days, we were musicians and teaching young people how to do immorality. But now, enter the call to sing in church. I just want to sing where you are. I want to worship God now for every, I, I, total, I, total, I did like 2,000 hours of jams. And I've told the Lord, I'm going to do 2,000 hours of praise worship. You will die in the 21st hour. <laughs> Insult. 
Big insult. Who are you trying to insult? You don't even know the depth of your sin. You just know what you did. You don't know what you cost. That's one of the reasons why I get angry. Say, so look at you trying to pay for sins. You know what they cost him? He thinks, he, he thinks sin is an act. <laughs> sin is an un- 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 unleashing of a spiritual force. Every time a man sins, commits iniquity, do you know what you, has done, you have done to the moon? You sin in a corner on the earth. Yet, Jupiter is not balanced again. And you don't know. It's like a little boy. He goes to a filling station when they are selling fuel. He lights a match and throws it into the nozzle. What did he commit? The throwing of a flame into the nozzle. And he runs away. He didn't know when the place exploded. When the underground tanks began to blow. When one gas pipe there blew open. And because it has happened before. And down the street, he didn't know there was um, gas piping down the street. The whole street caught fire. 50 people died. 70 houses burnt. They now go around and say, I want to pay for your sins. You are blowing out matches. <laughs> and now you see a match, you blow it out. So why are you blowing out match? You say, you know, we used to throw away matches those days, but now. So you, you, are not, you now have a mental match problem. Are you getting my everywhere you go? You go bed days, not concerned, you see candle, you blow. <laughs> that is precisely <laughs> what we do when we are trying to pay for our sins. Because what you know is the act. You don't know the spiritual impact of what happened. You sin on the earth, two galaxies collide. And you don't realize it all. They fuse because of your iniquity. What I say is not a joke. Adam sinned, the heavens were touched. They blocked your Jesus. You didn't, you didn't blow yourself, only came to, cook, to cleanse your sins. That's not all. Part of what Jesus died for was to rearrange the galaxies, put them in their right places because the iniquity of man affects them. You now want to do two righteous works and say you are paid for sin. Jesus said, hey, shut up. You don't know what they call paying for sin. If it was that easy, you think I like to die? You don't know it's cheaper to have all of you do the opposite of what you did. For me to go to the cross. You know the blood that was shed? Let's not even go near that one. So he feels thoroughly insulted. When somebody is doing good works, because of the sins they committed in the past. So it's either accept forgiveness or don't accept it. If you accept it and still try to pay, I now punish you on top of it. Because every act of attempted paying for sin is another sin in itself. That's how Christianity is. So people do good works for two reasons. We're trying to say they want to preserve the blessing. They want to get more blessing. Now sometimes they just want to pay all of them evil. So God take, took Job. Say, so let's put Job here. Let's take away all that he has. So even the good works he did, if he thought that was why he came, it, those things came, he would get tired of good works. If that was all the reasons he did good works. I heard a story once, and I've used to preach a number of times. One young woman has been following God for a while, looking for blessing, everything, including husband. And one day she gave God a date. And told her friends, I have given God till December. If by December he doesn't manifest all the things we have asked for. And you must understand, when the modern day Christian is saying she asked God for something, she knows what she means. Seed has gone in. It's not just asking by mouth now. How can you ask God by mouth? She has cleared her account once or twice. She has joined in buying Pastor a car. They've told her, as Pastor is driving into the horizon, your blessing will be going. <laughs> They've told her that now. As this building is going up, your, ha- your life is going up. You've heard those, those things before. I hope in all of them, lies. They are Pentecostal scams. When somebody gives a testimony, they say, connect with this testimony with your offering. 
I hope you don't do such things anymore. Otherwise, God will punish you. What are you connecting with? Oh, wait, don't be, don't, I'm sure you are not amazed that I'm not very popular in many circles because of things like this. But when I'm popular, I'm seriously popular. <laughs> Rubbish. So she's done all of those things she has. No, you know now. Ah, you two, you've been there. Remember the story of the young woman who came? She stood here that day, right here, after I finished preaching. Went to ask me something. When she was serving NYC, she said she gave out every single cupboard she was paid. He said, Pastor, I suffered. She said she lost weight. Fine girl like this, she was thin. And that she was done. That one day somebody sent her money, was her bed. They said, I thank God, though, she will manage this one, 20,000 naira. So then she went to church. Then pastor said, except it pains you. He said, oh God, nah, I, 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 I mean, this 20,000 is removing my pain. So I had to go back into pain. So I put the money. <laughs> like I also say, always say, I have no problem with you giving anything. We've given offerings before too. Are you getting my point? Is why that's the issue. So I asked the young woman, I said, why did you do that? She said, they told us that's how to prosper. I said, God has answered your prayers. Your seed has germinated. I am the fruit that God... <laughs> yes, I told her that day. I said, that is just like Peter was sent to Cornelius. Are you getting my point? To show him that alms giving does not bring salvation. I said, in the same manner, God has sent me to tell you that that's not how to prosper. I said, don't feel bad. You have learned your lesson. Now sit down here and hear the word. Thank you for tuning in for today's broadcast. I believe that the Lord spoke to you through those words. Uh, today's broadcast was a production of Kingdom World Ministries, a non-denominational teaching ministry based in Enugu, Nigeria. And it was brought to you on the bill of friends and co-workers of the ministry. To get more messages like you heard today, and including today's message, please go to the website pastor.ng. There you will find hundreds of messages, books, different sermons, and tracts that we have compiled over time. They are all available for your edification. Please, if today's broadcast was a blessing to you, send us a mail. I would like to read your testimony. The email address is right now on the screen. Copy it and send us a mail so that we will know what God is doing in your life through this broadcast. This program will come up again same time next week and I'm looking forward to you being around with us. And when you are doing that, please invite your friends and your loved ones to join in with you. And until that time, may the Lord be with you.